तुम सो चालू करो यस हेलो गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन दिस इज सीए गौतम लाट फ्रॉम डब्ल्यू आई आर सी आई वेलकम यू ऑल ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ डब्ल्यू आई आर सी आई एम सॉरी देर इज सम इश्यू विद माय वेब कैम सो टुडे वी आर स्टार्टिंग विद आर अनदर सेशन ऑफ जीएसटी सेक्टोरियल सीरीज व्हिच इज ऑन रिटेल एंड एफ एम सी जी एंड वी हैव टूडे आर एमिनेट स्पीकर सी ए वसंत के भट्ट हु इज यू नो वेल नोन नेम इन रिटेल इंडस्ट्री वेन यू नो इट कम्स टू जीएसटी इश्यू so uh, i hope you guys are enjoying everyone enjoying the gst sectorial series we are soon launching the gst sectorial series 3 also so uh, i request everyone to kindly join the same also and we are come uh, we have already launched gst sectorial series part 2 which we are starting from this month uh, with this background i quickly come forward uh, you know i'll quickly move to our today's session um with the introduction of our today's speaker so mr vasant k bhatt is a chartered accountant having more than 23 years of experience in profession and practicing specially in the area of excise service tax vat and then now gst he was co-opted member of indirect tax committee of icai in 2012 he co-authored the background material for certificate course on indirect taxation ebook on point of taxation published by icai and wrc reference manual published by wrc of icai He is also a co-compiler of background material on model GST law published by ICI for the training of government officer. He has co-authored book GST classification and exemption. A regular speaker on GST, he is independent director and chairman of audit committee of a Mumbai-based pharmaceutical company, member of indirect tax committee of chamber of tax consultants, and he is partner with uh, Mrs. Hire uh, Hire Ganga and Associates. With this brief background, I request uh, you to sir kindly please. you know elaborate okay uh, thank you gautam sir thank you uh, wrc for giving me this opportunity hello everyone welcome to the today's session on uh, retail and uh, fmcg the topic what we are covering today is uh, little background on uh, uh, retail and fmcg classification multiple rates discounts schemes promotional activities then uh, combo packs which are very common in fmcg then the movement of goods loyalty points then vouchers credit note sales return expired goods cross charge versus isd composition scheme urmp fmcg trade partners the entire topic today what we are discussing is pertaining to fmcg how it impacts Uh, the fmcg industry or uh, the issues involved in fmcg industry will discuss about first let us come to the background fmcg fast moving consumer goods so as the goods carrying fmcg also moves very fast or conveys as we have seen because some of them may be a uh, perishable uh, that is the reason they fast uh, they move very fast and as such it is consumed by the consumers very frequently and uh, uh, it is a day in day out required product this is the fourth largest sector in the indian economy this category includes food and beverages which includes groceries uh, fresh and frozen foods packaged and semi packaged foods aerated and non aerated uh, beverages etc then personal hygiene and household goods that is toiletries stationery clothing cleaning products cosmetics cleaning uh, cleaning products and uh, stationery glassware etc etc the general healthcare product that is uh, normally we call uh, nutraceuticals or uh, health supplements uh, which are required for uh, human as well as for animal and other uh, some healthcare products so it is one of the most regulated sectors see as far as uh, food is concerned food safety stand and standard act is applicable and rules made there under and as far as cosmetics are concerned the drugs and cosmetics act and rules made there under would be applicable these are all highly regulated and food and drug administration fda is the regulatory authority which deals with Uh, regulation of this food and uh, cosmetics products 
the these products are generally meant for human consumption or application on human or animal there's a reason it is always highly regulated rules and regulations are to be strictly followed in any case if there are any contraventions or non compliances the repercussions would be always very severe there's a reason everybody who are involved in this sector would be very cautious and in their compliances with regard to these rules and regulations fmcg goods are typically include repeat and daily usage items meant for ultimate consumers hence a large number of uh, large customer base and sold through retail and modern sales the classification is one of the important steps in gst for any uh, sector whether it is supply of goods or supply of services in case of uh, fmcg it is all the more important because number of goods involved or uh, number of uh, categories of the goods involved are substantial in fmcg sector so cl why classification or before going to why let us understand what is mean by classification because those who have engaged or uh, familiar with the central excise and customs matter they may be knowing about the classification in vat also it was there but not the way in which it is there in the case of uh, uh, gst or even in case of uh, excise and customs so it is something new to the service sector as well so uh, therefore it is very important to understand uh, the classification in detail especially in fmcg sector because the because of its very nature the general meaning of classification is segregation of goods or services according to their nature and characteristics and assigning the headings and subheadings to them there is no definition given under the gst act this is the general meaning that means simply we have to identify and assign particular number so that the product will be identified by that particular number given that is hsn so why classification is required it is important for determining the rate of tax applicable to that particular goods and also to understand whether any exemption is applicable for that particular goods and also to see what are the applicable conditions applicable to these particular goods and also whether rcm is required Uh, for that particular supply of goods or services for uh, complying all these things or knowing all these things the uh, classification is very important then what happens if the goods is, goods are wrongly classified under uh, uh, wrong uh, classification or hsn uh, especially in case of fmcg multiple goods are involved and may be having slight difference or the difference between two items may be very thin uh, look wise may be same or ingredients may be same but there may be some changes with regard to uh, the uh, process involved or application or sometimes even the contents may be different and the application would be the same so because of various uh, similarities it becomes all the more difficult to do the correct classification so what happens if it is wrongly classified is the first of all there will be substantial demand in the uh, future along with interest penalty because you may end up classifying your product at lesser rate though actual classification or correct classification may attract higher rate in that case there will be demand and when demand comes along with interest and penalty so it becomes really a big cost in future Uh, if any wrong things are done with regard to classification it may also happen that because of the wrong classification you may end up claiming the wrong exemption which you are not at all eligible then you may end up claiming the wrong itc also in the certain blocked credit are there uh, because of the classification you would have treated as something else and ultimately when it is found this particular uh, credit is ineligible for your activity then you have to reverse along with interest penalty because of this uh, huge losses or uh, huge cost involved in this uh, wrong uh, uh, compliances you will end up in having loss in your business 
which will be followed by loss of reputation also. Let us understand uh, the differences in these uh, items, cosmetics and medicines. They are like twins, having many similarities. So we need to clearly understand what is mean by cosmetics and what is mean by medicines so that the correct classification can be made. Let us understand some precedents. The High Court of Madhya Pradesh in the case of Global Telemall held that hair wash or shampoo prepared from Ayurvedic ingredients having therapeutic quality was classifiable as Ayurvedic medicine. Normally what we understand shampoo is a cosmetic item. It is used to clean the hair. But if it has got the therapeutic quality, therapeutic means curing ability. A prophylactic means the preventive ability, preventive quality in that product. So if it is having a therapeutic quality or preventive, that is uh, prophylactic uh, quality, then it could be treated as medicines provided other conditions are met with. This is one of the important criteria, this uh, a therapeutic quality or prophylactic quality in case of med classification of medicines. This is the primary ingredients which should be complied with. In addition to that, the FDA licenses, Food and Drug Administration, under the Drugs and Cosmetics Act, gives the different types of licenses for manufacturing, storing, and uh, selling uh, these uh, uh, medicines as well as for cosmetics. Again, the, the license number, the procedure involved in that for different product like uh, medicine and cosmetics are different. These are also the indicative or the documents which supports your classification. So various elements are to be, factors are to be considered to understand whether it is a cosmetics or medicines. Accordingly, right classification has to be done. If a primary pro, uh, the product's primary function is cure and not, uh, uh, sorry, care and not cure, it is not a medicament. The cosmetic products are used in enhancing or improving a person's appearance or beauty, whereas medical uh, medicinal products are used to treat or cure some medical condition. This is the decisions of the Supreme Court in case of CN laboratories. So as I said earlier, in case of uh, medicaments, the primary function of the product should be either uh, cure or prevent the diseases. If it is for care, that means uh, which enhances the appearance or beauty, then that would be treated as cosmetics and not as the medicaments. Then again, with regard to food supplements, there are challenges because certain food supplements are very close to medicines. Uh, the food supplements in the uh, modern language also called as nutraceuticals. It should be taken for uh, maybe for a particular period or throughout for enhancing your immunity or uh, for your well-being. But it will not be uh, serve the purpose of medicines. It cannot be treated as a medicines. The distinction between these two would be very, uh, very thin. So we need to understand from various aspects or factors which are required for a classification to uh, see whether it is a food supplement or medicines. Swad having therapeutic value is medicine, though it is sold in a tea stall or beetle shop. Candel World Drug Agencies, they are, this edition of the Rajasthan High Court. It is not necessary that medicine should be sold through chemist or medical shop only. It can be sold through some other shops like uh, tea stall or beetle shop also. Moment it is sold in tea stall or beetle shop, it cannot be said that it is a food item, not a medicine. So we have to see the overall, uh, the criteria required for classification to decide these things. Sri Baidyanath Ayurved Bhavan Limited versus CC, this is a decision of the Supreme Court, where it is said, scientific and technical meaning of the terms and expressions used in tax laws like Excise Act not to be resorted to. The goods to be classified according to the popular meaning attached to them by those using the product. In case of Dantamanjan Lal uh, edition was, here it was said, Dantamanjan Lal is not a medicine, so this is decided on the basis of trade parallel theory. 
there is a, a non technical theory which is applied for the classification of the goods that is called as trade parallel theory in this as per this theory we have to see how it is used by the consumer how it is known in the market what the trade knows about this product whether it would be trade is using this or known as a medicine or as a food supplement or what else so based on the perception of the trade and industry or the consumer who are using such product the classification will be made and there is no scientific method involved in this it is purely based on how it is known in the market so this is also one of the important theory in case of classification of goods then uh, this product sanitizers has been the prominent product in the last two years because of the pandemic this product gained a lot of importance at the same time it brought several issues also in the gst compliances this product can be classified under uh, these different headings depending upon its nature it can be classified as cleaning preparations under chapter heading 3402 it can be classified as skin washing liquid under chapter 3401 and hand cleansers are classified under 3003 and disinfectant are classified under 3808 these all these different classifications are for the different product altogether they may be similar in uh, some of its nature but uh, what has happened is uh, prior to this pandemic many pharma companies or other uh, manufacturers or manufacturing these hand cleansers and uh, classified under chapter 3003 this is uh, medicaments this was treated as medicaments because it had the ability to prevent the spread of the virus and for uh, it, it was used as a disinfectant in uh, uh, on human being used on human being and uh, it is mainly used in the hospital or other healthcare uh, uh, facilities so there was no dispute it was a settled matter and uh, the uh, this particular product was attracting 12 percent uh, presently in gst also it was uh, 12 percent earlier uh, it was six percent i believe so uh, but uh, what happened uh, after uh, this pandemic spread wto world trade organization issued one document wherein they said this classification for disinfectant is chapter 3808. After that, the department started inquiry throughout India and whoever is manufacturing this hand sanitizers under the under chapter 3003 issued the notices saying that it cannot be classified as medicaments. It is only a disinfectant and it should be classified under 3808 because it is a substitute for uh, soap and water which should be uh, cleaned uh, which are used for cleaning the hands and uh, uh, if uh, the cleaning is done for say more than 20 seconds it is uh, it, it is sufficient to avoid the use of water and uh, uh, soap hand sanitizers are being advised therefore it cannot be a medicament and it should be classified under disinfectant only but what we need to understand is hand sanitizers which are uh, manufactured as medicaments are meant for use on human being on the skin similarly even uh, skin washing liquid also but there can be some differences in the it, uh, the skin washing liquid could be simply liquid soap and cleaning preparation it is uh, not only uh, used on human being it could be used on uh, uh, inanimate things also whereas this disinfectant covered under chapter 3808 is surely classifiable uh, or usable on inanimate things only it cannot be used on human being or animal this is said in the H explanatory note to hsm which is a guiding tool for classification of the goods throughout the world so as per the explanatory note only those products which are used on things 
uh, say on uh, surface or any other woods that can be classified under chapter 3008 but uh, if it is usable on uh, human being or animal it cannot be classified under chapter 38 but still department based on the uh, document of that wto is demanding tax because this uh, chapter 3008 attracts 18 percent whereas uh, uh, hand clean cleanser falling under chapter 3003 attracts 12 percent so this differential six percent tax has been demanded at various locations on uh, all the manufacturers and this issue is now it is there at various level including the high court this rate notification one by 2017 is the uh, notification which has prescribed the description of the goods as well as the rate applicable to that particular goods see unless earlier tax regime where there was a specific act central excise tariff act which had the very detailed classification of the goods and uh, the rate applicable and also the unit of measure it was there how it is to be measured so and also it had authorized the government to issue the notification for specifying the effective rate or maybe partial exemption or full exemption but in gst that is not there it is done through by way of notification and this notification till very recently that's up to 31st march 2021 it used to say only two digit or four digit hsn code is to be mentioned in the invoices if the turnover is up to 1.5 crore you need not mention any hsn code you are exempted from mentioning the hsn code above 1.5 crore up to 5 crore the hsn code requirement was two digit and uh, above the turnover of uh, uh, 5 crore four digit hsn code was required to be mentioned now from 1st april 2021 it is said up to 5 crore only four digit and uh, above 5 crore only six digit classific hsn code is to be mentioned in the invoice see this four digit code denotes only the heading and six digit code denotes only the subheading eight digit code gives the tariff item which is a very detailed classification if there is eight digit requirement it becomes easy for the person to understand what product is covered where based on the uh, hsn uh, <coughs> notification or uh, the act the problem which is happening is because of the six code digit where only subheading is mentioned the description of the product may not exactly match with the subheading then dispute starts the assessee may say my product will squarely fall under this subheading but department may say no it will not so this is the problem with regard to this uh, uh, lesser digit classification and one more issue is this unit of measure is not at all there in this rate notification it will not serve major purpose but for statistical purpose it was very important especially when you send the goods for job work you will send the goods in one particular uh, unit say <laughs> in terms of kg when it comes back it may not be in terms of kg it may be in meter or it may be number or whatever it is that unit will change but in the absence of uniformity in mentioning these uh, units there could be some dispute or st statistic data may not be may not be correctly available this would be the challenge in the absence of a unit of measure in the rate notification what are the factors we need to consider in the classification of fmcg goods one is its ingredients because it's very important based on the ingredients many classifications are required to be determined uh, which will be the appropriate head of uh, uh, chapter head and manufacturing process <clears throat> there are certain product which is classified based on the manufacturing process involved and packing that's also very important if it is for retail pack classification may differ if it is for uh, uh, wholesale or uh, industrial use then classification may be different 
then end use this is also very very important uh, factor which is to be considered what is the end use of that product so based on that classification is to be determined then of course trade balance i had said already what is mean by trade balance that is the, the how that product is known in the market that also factors in the classification of these goods then in the notification rate notification there is one residuary entry <clears throat> that is entry number 453 of schedule 3 which says goods which are not specified in schedule 1 2 4 5 or 6 that would be classified under this particular entry this is similar to s12 tariff item 68 of 1975 it is intended to cover those goods which are not specifically included in the shed, other schedule but to be resorted if any goods fail to find any entry in other schedule this is the well laid on principle with regard to residuary or resort into residuary entry however what we are seeing is wherever the description of the product is not matching with the subheading then the department is resorting to the classification classifying that particular product under this residuary entry because this will be attracting 18 percent if the correct classification uh, attracts a lesser rate then you have more challenge because you may be having tendency to classify and this particular product under uh, a particular chapter heading which attracts lesser rate based on the merit but the a description what is given by you may not be matching with the subheading or description of the subheading given in the notification therefore that dispute will be there so once this classification with eight digit is made mandatory then so many disputes which would arise out of this confusion may not be there so hopefully in the time to come department will resort to that government will uh, ask for the eight digit classification just like what it was there under central excise as well as what it is there in case of uh, customs then another challenge with regard to this uh, fmcg product are multiple rates applicable to the goods in order there all the rates which are there would be covered under the FMCG sector. That is, certain goods are exempt, certain goods are attracting 5% or 12% or 18% and even 28% as well. So what happens is uh, this uh, FMCG goods are to be or are used by by many or all we can say, whether irrespective of their uh, uh, their financial position whether they is rich or poor whether he is belonging to particular religion or not whether he is located in particular geography or some other geography irrespective of that everybody will use the fmcg goods so government is also very careful while deciding the uh, deciding this rate what happens is uh, <clears throat> if the higher rates are prescribed it will cost to the consumer so even the rich person also pays the same amount of tax on that goods and if that particular goods is used by the poor person he also would bear the same uh, he will also pay the same tax so uh, therefore it is very important to ensure that it is always balanced and if it is taxed it becomes a cost to the consumer if it is not taxed then it becomes exempt in case of exempt itc would not be available so that itc becomes a cost to the consumer therefore uh, that uh, balance is to be properly uh, seen uh, which rate uh, is more appropriate considering the uh, itc available for, for that particular product for example if a, uh, the overall itc available with regard to that particular product is more than the tax paid or payable on that particular product or output tax payable on that product 
then uh, if such products are made exempt then it is going to increase the cost if the outward tax is more than the inward uh, or input tax or credit available <clears throat> on that particular product then there is no issue but if it is totally exempt then uh, the tax whatever is paid on the purchase of raw material and uh, all the related uh, inward supplies that is going to increase the cost and that uh, itc chain will get broken then multiple rates lead to more disputes so when uh, for particular category of product multiple rates are available it is the tendency of the human being to ensure that his product falls under lower rate so that it will be cheaper because this fmcg uh, goods are very price sensitive if something is little cheaper people will be preferring to buy such products so one has to be very careful about its pricing so if the rates are going to be the gst rates are going to be higher it will be ultimately the overall price or the price which is fixed as rsp or mrp that would be higher so the persons will be the person involved or the manufacturer would be trying to classify this product under the lowest possible rate and such things are resorted to definitely it is going to lead to disputes department may say no this product cannot be classified under this it should be classified under some other chapter which will attract higher rate so more number of rates will lead to more disputes this is what we have seen in case of central excise matters then maintenance of record and compliance is also very cumbersome if the number of uh, uh, rates are more applicable conditions are more in such cases it becomes uh, the compliance also becomes complicated then in some cases uh, rates are based on certain specification like fresh or chilled or dried so in case of uh, fruits what happens fresh or uh, chilled fruits are uh, not uh, taxable whereas dried fruits becomes uh, taxable or uh, different rate is applicable or different classification is applicable again among the items which are fresh or chilled whether it is packed in unit container with a brand or not also make the difference unit container means this is the container which contains the specified quantity of goods so brand uh, we are uh, we know what the brand is we will discuss that in a little more detail so if a particular product is having a uh, sold along with the brand or sold under a brand also put up in unit container then it will attract a different classification for example meat and fish etc similarly uh, edible vegetables uh, etc and if it is uh, not put up in unit container and not branded then classification will differ similarly rate are based on the value of the goods in some cases like footwear and apparels the rate of tax depends upon the value of that particular goods so these are all the various uh, uh, factors which we need to see for the purpose of uh, uh, classification and these are the various these multiple rates are the challenges which are posing in case of fmcg products then brand name <clears throat> the brand name or trade name is defined to mean a brand name or trade name whether registered or not that is a name or a mark such as symbol monogram label signature or invented word for the purpose of indicating or so as to indicate a connection in the course of trade between such specified goods and some person using such name or mark with or without any indication of the identity of that person the, this particular definition is uh, uh, specified in this we rubber products private limited uh, supreme court decision so it could be anything it could be a trade name registration is immaterial and it could be a mark 
as a symbol or it could be a monogram or it could be a label or signature or any invented word only what it has to do, do is it has to connect with the manufacturer the product should be connected with the manufacturer <clears throat> that is the most important thing let us see some of the uh, examples there is a difference between uh, brand name and house mark it is very important to understand this difference because it is very common in case of fmcg product the brand name is the one by which the product is identified and asked for it is the connection between the uh, consumer or the, it is the connection between the manufacturer and the uh, final product house mark is an identification of the manufacturer it simply says about the manufacturer or it is only an identification of the manufacturer who has manufactured it for example this tata is a house mark whereas this titan tanish voltas all those things are the different brands owned by tata so uh, these are all the product brands and this is only a house mark tata is only a house mark so we need to clearly understand between the house mark and brand name so house mark uh, will not make much difference with regard to classification but when it is branded then definitely there will be changes now question arises when there is a house mark whether it is amounting to brand so we will see various uh, uh, settled matter to understand this particular thing the declaration of name of the company as per the statutory requirements would not amount to bearing a brand name it is said in case of uh, tarai foods limited by supreme court so uh, just by mentioning the name of the company where it is mandatory under some statute would not amounting to bearing a brand so this is what is said in this particular case house mark usually a device in the form of an emblem word or both is an identification of the manufacturer which is compulsory under drugs uh, drugs rule product mark or a brand name invariably a word or combination of a word and letter or numeral is the one by which product is identified and asked for this is the supreme court decision in case of astra pharmaceuticals recently uh, not recently this uh, uh, this is a 2002 case the mark bad uke on the packages of unmanufactured tobacco imported were merely for the purpose of identification of packages to select suppliers identify and uh, did not constitute brand name within the meaning of note 1 of chapter 24 of the central excise tariff act this is the supreme court decision in case of itc limited there are like that there are many case laws where uh, it has been uh, clearly uh, specified what is the difference between the house mark and the brand name but still there are many challenges in clearly understanding this in the practical uh, issues in case of uh, australian food india private limited 2013 case supreme court decision in this particular case what had happened was there was one uh, uh, single brand outlet cookie man outlet whereby the cookies were being sold those cookies there was no uh, brand on the cookie on the product itself there was no brand but it was sold in the single branded outlet then the question came whether ssi exemption would be eligible or not for such uh, uh, thing then uh, the matter went up to supreme court and in the supreme court what has been said is its physical manifestation on the goods is not a compulsory requirement uh, such as uh, requirement such goods can be said to be branded as long as uh, as long as its environment conveys so that is packaging wrapping accessories uniform of the vendors invoices menu cards hoardings display boards of outlet furniture props specific outlet itself in its entirety and other such factors all of which together or individually 
or in parts may convey that goods is branded that means physical manifestation of the brand on the product is not essential and that entire environment under which that particular product is being sold can also make that particular product branded normally what we understand is branded means that brand should be mentioned on the goods so cold held it is not necessary other circumstances under which this uh, uh, particular goods has been sold may also change the scenario or may also make it branded similar view was held in case of appellate ar maharashtra in the case of aditya birla retail limited in this case uh, uh, some uh, uh, <coughs> cereal uh, flour was uh, sold under the brand name of more and uh, the question was it is on uh, the uh, uh, the supplier uh, sought to uh, get the ar and uh, his contention was this particular product uh, is not a branded one it is merely name of the manufacturer is being mentioned there or uh, brand of the outlet is being mentioned there or name of the outlet is being mentioned there the ar also said in the similar way as it was held in the case of australian food products that uh, the circumstances facts and circumstances under which it is being sold it amounts to a branded product accordingly it should be classified as such and high rate would be applicable then uh, next issue in case of fmcg is the discount schemes and promotional expenses it is very common in case of fmcg product see how uh, there could be some structured discount or it may be there could be some spot discounts the gst law gst act section 15 provides that the gst is payable on the transaction value the transaction value is the price that is uh, paid or payable on uh, uh, supply and uh, uh, that is acceptable as transaction value where supplier and the recipient are not related party and price is the sole consideration so these two are important uh, aspect for the purpose of uh, uh, accepting the transaction value then section 15 also provides for certain discounts where gst is not applicable so conditions are it should be known at the time or prior to the supply and it should be mentioned in the tax invoice so moment any uh, value of discount is mentioned in the tax invoice the gst is not payable on that taxable value will be reduced from that amount and there is no dispute with regard to that sometimes what happens quantity will be given as free it may be in the it will be given in different manner say in case of tax invoice product a and product b are being sold say product a 100 rupee product b is 20 rupee then a rate will be mentioned against each product and subsequently total minus uh, the value of product b that is 20 rupee will be deducted and on 100 rupee these two products will be sold so this is absolutely fine Here, this also will be considered as a discount but it will be this discount will be in the nature of a, a value only sometimes what happens is in the invoice itself that product b is mentioned as the given free so th this will be treated as a, a quantity discount this also is acceptable there is no challenge with regard to valuation under section 15. <coughs> so different uh, uh, methodology is followed in the trade and industry especially in case of fmcg industry the product which is given uh, free it could be buy one get one free or it could be different item also sometimes it may be uh, the same uh, attracting the same rate of tax or it may sometimes attract a different rate of tax in any case as long as it is mentioned in the invoice details are mentioned in the invoice there is no uh, challenge with regard to tax liability but there could be some impact with regard to itc so as we have seen section 17 5 which says the goods disposed of uh, uh, disposed of by, disposed of by way of uh, gifts or free samples uh, the credit on which is restricted <clears throat> in such cases what happens moment you say the goods are given free department will try to 
apply this section 175 and say itc is not eligible you have to reverse the itc so in my view it may not be correct because this particular item what you are giving free along with sale of another item is neither in the form of gift nor in the form of a free sample why it is not gift as we have understood or in uh, income tax matters or uh, any other cases gift means the gift is nothing but the which is given uh, given out of uh, natural love and affection without expecting anything in the return but in case of uh, business in case of uh, trade are we giving something uh, gift without expecting anything this free item or the goods given first of all it is condition only when product a is purchased you will get product b product b is not given uh, independently without any condition secondly the cost of product a <coughs> may also include uh, uh, some cost of product b this is what was uh, clarified in uh, one of the circulars but subsequently that circular because of certain controversy it was withdrawn and uh, so long as it is uh, the, this particular free item is given in the course or furtherance of the business which is conditional of the sale then there should not be any disallowance and of itc and it is not in the nature of free sample also so uh, the item what is given is uh, uh, for the purpose of enhancing the business or create more demand and uh, it is conditional normally free samples are given without uh, uh, without any conditions just to increase the awareness or brand or for anticipating business it is distributed but in case of buy one get one free or one product free along with another product in such cases there is a condition attached to it only when you buy that particular product at that particular rate you will get the other item free so it is not in the nature of gift or uh, not in the nature of a free sample also therefore credit should be allowed in my view however this dispute is going to be there and only courts can intervene and uh, uh, conclude this because already there are many ars which have said this moment it is said, uh, given free itc is to be reversed and there can also be a question <coughs> uh, because schedule one says permanent transfer or disposal of asset on which itc is taken amounts to supply though there is no uh, value to it so in this case i would say it is not even asset because what the meaning we understand with regard to asset is either it has to be a fixed asset or it has to be a current asset other in other words this should be included as a part of the balance sheet fixed asset we know and with regard to the inventory the, the current asset the valuation uh, rules provided under the uh, accounting standard says it should be valued at cost or net realizable value whichever is lower when the net re realizable value is zero though the cost may be higher then there won't be any valuation to it when it is not part of the balance sheet as asset then in my view it will not get covered under the schedule one also so uh, there is no outward supply uh, with regard to value uh, items which are given free of cost so itc should also be available again which is subject to you know uh, the legal scrutiny by the department then post supply discounts <clears throat> what happens uh, sometimes the discounts are not now near the time of the uh, uh, supply whether that can be treated as discount and whether you can issue credit note and reduce the value of supply so section 15.3 provides certain conditions where which need to be complied for the purpose of post supply discounts what it says is there has to be an agreement before the supply and this agreement should provide for cert, uh, the occurrence or event which will make you to entitle for the discount and also method of computation say the target and the turnover target upon uh, achieving certain
హలో హలో సార్ ఆవాజ్ నీ ఆ రైన్ కదా ఆడియో జాయిన్ అయ్యారు
हेलो सर सर आपका पीपीटी चालू करिए सर हाँ हाँ हेलो एम आई ऑडिबल यस सर यस सर मेरा पीपीटी अभी दिख रहा है यस yes, सर पीपीटी दिख रहा है सर आ, कौन सा पीपीटी तक आ, मेरा आवाज नहीं सुन रहा था दस नंबर से दस नंबर से हाँ सर ओ सर नेटवर्क का इशू है मेरे यहाँ से तो पता नहीं पूरा दो दो मीटिंग चालू दोनों मीटिंग में वही सेम प्रॉब्लम आ गया ओ ओके ओके सॉरी सर ओके नो इशू नो इशू नाउ इट इज कनेक्टेड टू ऑडियंस नहीं सर नौ लोग हैं वो ज्वाइन करेंगे सर फोन कब मैं चालू कर सकता हूँ वो बता दीजिए ये सर आप चालू करिए एक्सट्रीमली सॉरी फॉर द इनकनवीनियंस कॉस्ट गुड फिफ्टीन ट्वेंटी मिनट्स हैव बीन लैप्स्ड आई विल ट्राई टू मेक इट एंड नाउ आई विल कम बैक फ्रॉम वेर आई लेफ्ट और वेर यू स्टॉप लिसनिंग मी दैट इज मल्टीपल रेट्स वाट आई वॉज टेलिंग इज दिस एफ एम सी जी प्रोडक्ट्स इन्वॉल्व गुड्स अट्रैक्टिंग मल्टीपल रेट्स एन नंबर ऑफ गुड्स एंड द मल्टीपल मोर नंबर ऑफ रेट्स अप्लीकेबल टू दो गुड्स सम आर एक्सेप्टेड सम आर फाइव परसेंट ट्वेल्व परसेंट एटीन परसेंट इन दिवन सम ऑफ द प्रोडक्ट्स अट्रैक्ट ट्वेंटी एट परसेंट एज वेल वट एपन्स दिस कंज्यूमर गुड्स आर यूज बाय एवरी वन बी इट रिच और पुअर बी इट बिलोंगिंग टू वन पर्टिकुलर रिलीजन और नॉट और बेस्ड इवन the across the geographical locations there is no distinction everywhere these fmcg goods are being used the type may, may vary a little bit but overall uh, it is a uh, very day to day required uh, com commodity so therefore while fixing the rate also government has to be very careful to ensure that it is not uh, having any a difficult economic position for the poor or any particular sector of the people at the same time revenue is also not lost so uh, the multiple rates are necessary because of all these uh, uh, reasons but at the same time these multiple uh, multiple rates will create lot many administrative problem even for the government as well as for the consumers if the goods are exempted then what happens uh, uh, the tax or the cost to the consumer will go up in some case because what happens in the itc which is whichever is involved on that particular product will not be available in case of exempt goods then that becomes the cost if the quantum of itc is more than the tax on output in that case the if the product is exempted then cost will increase rather than reducing the cost if it is taxed that cost anyway is cost to the uh, consumer so therefore it is very important to have this balance to ensure that uh, the tax is not burden to the consumer to a greater extent and it will, the multiple rates will lead to more disputes so what happens uh, everyone will try to classify and apply lower rate for his product to ensure the uh, uh, better sales as all of us are aware this consumer goods are very price sensitive if product a is available at a particular price and product b is little lesser than that <coughs> cost is lesser than that then people may go for product b that's why even the manufacturer have to be very a sensible or uh, particular in fixing the price of the uh, fmcg goods maintenance of records and compliance is also very cumbersome where the number of rates are more you have to have the more compliances if exemption you have to apply rule 40 243 if it is lesser rate then you may end up in uh, inverted rate structure and so many things could happen because of the multiple rates then there are circumstances where rates are based on certain specification like fresh or chilled dried etc 
say in case of fruits if fresh or chilled red uh, i mean uh, uh, the goods are exempt if it is dried then it, it is liable for uh, tax at a different rate then in case of uh, uh, container uh, if the goods are packed in unit container along with brand then <clears throat> rates are different if the products are not uh, put up in unit container with brand then rates are different so the, all these factors will make the difference with regard to applicability of the uh, gst rate and in some cases rates are based on the value of the goods also uh, say footwear apparels etc if the rate are in excess of certain amount the different rates are applicable up to a certain amount rates it may be exempted or rates are at a lower uh, uh, lower rates may be applicable for these products then uh, multiple rates also creates the challenge of uh, brand where brand is uh, fixed on the goods along in the uh, good where the goods are put up in unit container then uh, the as i mentioned rates should be different so we need to understand what the brand is the brand name or trade name is defined to mean a brand name or trade name whether registered or not that is a name or a mark such as symbol monogram label signature or invented word for the purpose of indicating or so as to indicate the connection in the course of trade between the between such specified goods and some person using such name or mark with or without any indication of the identity of that person this is <coughs> decided by the honorable supreme court in case of wee rubber products and uh, there is a distinction between brand name and house mark it is very important to understand this distinction see house mark is the mark which connects the manufacturer that is it is the identification of the manufacturer whereas brand name is the one by which the product is identified and asked for so uh, when we go to uh, a shop we will not uh, tell the name of the manufacturer we will tell the brand name of that particular product the brand name in which that particular product is known for example this tata logo and this uh, name is the house mark whereas uh, uh, this uh, uh, land rover volta stanish titan etc are the various brands of tata so uh, th this distinction we need to clearly understand while deciding the uh, classification and applicable rate thereon it is but in the practical situation it is really difficult what amounts to branding what is not amounting to branding or what is only a house mark and what is brand name based on the settled legal principle we need to understand this the declaration of a name of a company as per the statutory requirement would not amount to bearing a brand name this is decided by the supreme court in case of tarai foods limited what it says is if it is simply you are mentioning the name of the manufacturer as per the statutory requirement on the goods or the product then it is not amounting to brand but situation or uh, in every case it is not as simple as that what we have seen, uh, seen is house mark usually a, a device in the form of an emblem word or both is an identification of the manufacturer which is compulsory under the drug rules whereas product mark or brand name invariably a word or combination of the word or letter or numeral is the one by which the product is identified and asked for this is the decision of the honorable supreme court in case of astra pharmaceuticals the marks bad uke on the packages of unmanufactured tobacco imported were merely for the purpose of identification of the packages to select suppliers identity and uh, did not constitute a brand name within the meaning of note 1 of chapter 24 of central access tariff act 1985 so the this was the <coughs> decision of the supreme court but the situation 
may be different in uh, some other uh, cases or based on the facts and circumstances of the case. So in case of uh, Australian Food uh, India Private Limited, in this case, what has happened was the there was single uh, branded outlet called Cookie Man, wherein the cookies were being sold. The brand Cookie Man or uh, the brand of the Australian food product it was not embossed on the product. So they were contemplating the uh, eligibility of SSI exemption, treating this as unbranded. But the matter went up to Supreme Court and Supreme Court said its physical manifestation on the goods is not a compulsory requirement. And uh, such goods can be said to be branded as long as its environment conveys so. That is packaging, wrapping, accessories, uniform of vendors, invoices, menu cards, holding, display boards of outlet, furniture, props, scientific outlet, itself in its entirety and other such factors, all of which together or individually or in parts may convey that goods is branded. Similar view was expressed in the case of Aditya Birla Limited by appellate AAR Maharashtra, <coughs> wherein in, the, in their uh, uh, branded outlet more, some uh, floor was uh, uh, put up in unit container and with that uh, uh, brand or with the name of uh, more uh, special or something like that it was sold the authority said it is amounting to brand because uh, the uh, atmosphere in which it is being sold whatever ratios were held in case of australian food products those were applied there and uh, on that basis it was decided it is a, a sale of branded goods. So we need to understand based on various aspects, facts and circumstances of the case, whether it is merely a housemark or brand name. So accordingly, the rate applicable, GST rate applicable would change. So it is very important to understand this aspect. Then come to discount teams promotional expenses. See, the, it is very common in case of FMCG goods to uh, give the discounts and uh, different discounts on different products. See, normally the discount uh, is, uh, it is there even, it was there even under the earlier tax regime also. Now in GST, GST is payable on the transaction value. Transaction value is the price uh, which is paid or payable on a particular transaction as a consideration and which is the transaction is not between the related parties and the consideration is the sole consideration. These are the two conditions where the price is accepted as transaction value and accordingly GST will be paid on that particular value. However, certain discounts are allowed subject to certain conditions and compliances and as per section 15. Section 15 says, if the discounts are given at the time of supply, then it should be mentioned in the invoice. <clears throat> and uh, sometimes what happens, uh, the along with the sale of product A, product B would be given as free. This can be given or mentioned in different ways in the invoices. Suppose in the invoices, product A say costs 100 rupee, then product B say costs 20 rupee, and total 120 and the value of product B would be deducted as discount and on 100 applicable tax would be applied. In such cases, it will be allowed as a discount and uh, there won't be any issue. At the same time, uh, there may be some other method where the company wants to show this product B, which is given free of cost, as a quantity given free or that particular product is given uh, free along with that, but uh, the product A. In such cases also, there is no challenge with regard to output tax liability. The value of product B will not be considered as a taxable value. And it is very common in case of uh, FMCG goods also, say buy one, get one free, or different items, maybe say of the same rate or different items will be given as free, and no issue. Whereas there can be some challenge with regard to ITC. Say, as we know, as per section 17.5, if any goods are given as a gift or a, a free sample, then ITC is restricted. The moment something is given free, the department may resort to section 17.5 and try to deny the credit. In my view, it is not 
correct in every cases say in case of goods uh, given free particular goods is given free along with sale of some other goods then it is conditional so when it uh, the goods are given under some condition or upon compliance of certain condition it cannot be called as gift also as we understand gift is the thing which is given out of natural love and affection without expecting anything in return whereas here our expectation is first you purchase that particular product a then only you will get the product b free so it cannot be called as gift and also the value of product a may include value of uh, or cost of product b as well and it cannot be called as free sample also say free sample again it is given in the course of business to uh, as a marketing strategy for uh, uh, making the uh, product known in the market and uh, uh, there is no uh, uh, consideration attached to it however in such cases where it is given free along with some other product it may be of the same product or it may be of some other product also then also it cannot be called as free sample because it is conditional one so in case of free sample there may not be any condition only with the expectation that business may come it is given here as a condition as a promise because you will be announcing this along the along with product a product b would be given free that you are announcing or you are making your packing accordingly in such cases it's a promise what you have made and as per your promise you have given it can be treated as a contract under the contract you are giving this so in such cases itc also should not be uh, disputed then the, there are situations of post supply discounts say uh, only after attaining certain level of turnover or achieving particular target uh, you will be entitled for certain amount of discount in such cases section 153 provides there has to be an agreement before the supply and that agreement should provide for occurrence or method of and method of computation the event which triggers the discount as well as how that discount would be computed that should be mentioned in that agreement and that agreement should be before the supply and it should be linked to relevant invoice as well and itc attributable to discount is reversed by the recipient this is one of the important conditions that means once a discount is given you need to issue credit note and when you issue credit note for discount the recipient has to reverse the itc availed on that particular product and thereafter you can adjust your uh, such discount against your or tax involved in this discount against your output tax liability so if you meet all these conditions it can be Uh, you can avail the discount then promotional expenses this is also very controversial thing in fmcg fmcg mainly runs on uh, advertisement and promotions it is very important for any uh, person involved in fmcg to do lot of uh, expenses on advertisement and promotion see advertisement is uh, a simple placement of message whereas sponsorship is ongoing arrangement on the event you may be sponsoring certain activity or you will be allowed to display your things that brand product etc etc so here the challenge is <coughs> uh, with regard to service absolutely there is no uh, challenge but if uh, uh, some goods are involved which are given as free as i mentioned earlier then there is a challenge with regard to itc then uh, distribution of free samples what happens uh, when you simply give the product to uh, make your uh, product known in the market or as a marketing strategy then what happens so it will not be treated as hello am i audible okay yes sir so, okay uh, can I, i will continue up to what time i can continue hello sir yes sir yes.
up to what time i can continue because there were in between we lost around 20 minutes can i extend by 10 minutes at least okay anyway without wasting time i will go ahead see this uh, <clears throat> uh, distribution of free samples whether it will be treated as outward supply as per schedule one so schedule one provides the, the permanent transfer of uh, or disposal of fixed assets uh, disposal of assets on which you have taken the input tax credit see this uh, promotional items or uh, the free distribution samples whatever uh, you are giving it to the uh, prosperous or uh, existing customers they will not have any uh, sale value as per the accounting principles if it has to be an asset it should be included in your balance sheet either as a fixed asset or as a current asset current assets includes inventory if you look at the valuation principles under accounting standard of the inventory it says you have to value at cost or net realizable value whichever is lower in case of these free samples or uh, bought out items which are to be used as uh, promotional items the, the realizable value is zero since it is zero it cannot be a part of inventory also once it is not part of inventory it cannot be the asset when it is not an asset schedule one is not applicable so as far as uh, distributing distributing free samples or promotional item is concerned the it will not be treated as outward supply that matter is very clear now what happens to input tax credit whether we will be eligible for input tax credit see uh, the with regard to free samples clearly it is restricted under section 175 so it says uh, the uh, uh, any goods disposed of by way of free sample is not eligible for itc whereas in case of promotional items uh, it is not uh, uh, it is not the free sample suppose you are dealing with product a and you purchases say product xyz with your brand and you are uh, uh, distributing along with your uh, 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 in the market to uh, increase your market uh, share or uh, make your product popular make your brand popular in such cases can you say it's a free samples because that those products which you are given with your uh, uh, brand are not at all your products so it's only for the awareness you have given this so it cannot be treated as free samples as well and as i mentioned earlier such products cannot be treated as free gift also but in uh, the practice matter is not as simple as uh, we said so because uh, the department will say moment you give something free without any consideration then straight away they will apply section 175 the Maharashtra AR in case, in case of Sanofi India Limited, what it said is the promotional products not given to customer under any contractual obligation and voluntarily given on certain conditions achieved by the customer, the yeah, ITC is not eligible. So it is uh, very difficult uh, if the proper uh, method or uh, proper care is not taken at the time of such uh, promotional activity as well as for distributing the free samples one has to be really careful because this fmcg products in a lot of uh, promotional activity and a lot of goods are distributed a lot of other activities are being carried on so in all those cases proper planning is to be done and proper transaction need to be properly structured to avoid the future disputes then combo packs it's very common in case of uh, fmcg products Two, pack, two different products or same products are packed together and sold together. So for understanding the GST implication on the combo packs, we need to understand what is mixed supply and what is composite supply. Composite supply means a supply made by a taxable person to a recipient. It consists of two or more taxable supplies or goods or services or both or any combination thereof. And which is uh, these product these supplies are naturally bundled and supplied in conjunction with each other in the ordinary course of business 
and one of which is a principal supply this is these are the various uh, various aspects in case of composite uh, supply if all these factors are there then only it becomes the composite supply then what is the mixed supply mixed supply means two or more individual supplies and made in conjunction with each other by a taxable person and such supplies are made for a single price and such supply does not constitute a composite supply so first of all the, the, the composite supply should be ruled out then only we can see whether it is a mixed supply based on this definition and also based on certain uh, principles laid down in european code of law certain uh, uh, important aspects can be understood as such the most important aspects in composite supply are naturally bundled and principal supply naturally bundled there is no straight jacket formula based on facts and circumstances of the each case we need to understand that means how how it is known in the market how commonly such transactions are happening that is what makes the naturally bundled the principal supply gives the essential character to the supply bundling of supplies into single composite supply must not alter the essential character of the principal supply suppose product a and product b uh, sorry supply a and supply b are uh, given together if supply a is the principal supply when it is given along with supply b it should not change the nature of supply a supply b should not change the nature of supply a then only it becomes principal supply and that uh, uh, particular supplies uh, can be treated as composite supply a natural bundling is a composite supply and artificial bundling is mixed supply so it is very important to understand the uh, thing whether it is naturally bundled or not in a mixed supply identification of principal supply and uh, is an improbable task that means there is no uh, single uh, principal supply all supplies are sub, uh, principal supplies only there is no one principal supply and in case of uh, 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 composite supply there will be one principal supply which is clearly identifiable as such and there are other ancillary supply to it so presence of principal supply and ancillary supply is easily identifiable in case of composite supply then in mixed supply supply of one good or services does not necessitate the supply of another goods or services so it is not uh, making other supply necessary for supplying this particular this thing it is uh, voluntarily two products or two supplies are given in such cases only it can be it will be mixed supply let us take some examples of uh, combo packs and how uh, it will impact the uh, gst compliance say uh, uh, buy toothpaste and get toothpaste free whether it is composite supply or mixed supply so in this case the product what is being sold is toothpaste and toothbrush is given free along with that packing also says as such as we have discussed earlier this one is neither a composite supply nor a mixed supply because toothbrush is given free it is not a supply and uh, toothpaste is the product which has been sold then what happens if it is sold as a dental kit where both the toothpaste and the toothbrush are sold together it will be packed together and it will be labeled as a dental kit and uh, uh, the common price single price is uh, uh, fixed for this particular product in such cases it becomes a mixed supply because you are intending to sell two products that is uh, toothpaste and uh, toothbrush and uh, uh, <coughs> buyer also wants to buy this tooth uh, both the products so in, you have to see the intention of the buyer as well as the intention of the seller to decide all this uh, whether it's a mixed supply or composite supply then package containing crayons paints brushes and drawing book these are all not naturally bundled it is artificially bundled or put it in a uh, single uh, package and sold together for some convenience or attracting or make it into a attractive product so therefore it is a, a mixed supply and in case of mixed supply 
uh, though that is single price the rate what is to be applied is the highest rate applicable to the components of that particular supplies so accordingly you need to discharge the uh, rate which is highest among all the ingredients on the entire value of that particular combo pack then uh, combo pack of popcorn and coke it is very commonly seen in case of movies movie theater where popcorn uh, say costing 300 and coke say costing 200 both put together it would be 500 but when you take as a combo you will get at 450 rupees so this is definitely a, a mixed supply and the highest rate is say 28 percent for coke that would be applicable on the entire value then toys with battery see battery cell is one uh, thing which is required for certain toys and it is integral to the functioning of the toys in such cases you are, when it comes together and manufacturer himself gives this uh, uh, battery along with the toys we can say it is naturally bundled but at the same time it can be separate separately also so depending upon the facts and circumstances uh, how it is being uh, sold what is labeled accordingly it will be decided and laptop with bag the lap manufacturer of the laptop he will not put the laptop in bag or he is not packing that laptop with the bag subsequently it is given it is not naturally bundled so definitely it is a mixed supply and accordingly the gst rate and other compliance should be done with then uh, movement of goods so we have said the it is uh, uh, past moving consumer goods we are discussing so movement of goods is uh, more in case of uh, fmcg goods prior to introduction of gst the people who are engaged in the fmcg goods they used to have the go downs at various states so that <coughs> they can transfer the goods from their factory to these uh, warehouses and from warehouses uh, supply used to be made uh, to the respective uh, uh, respective stockist or the retailers in that particular state so applying the local tax otherwise this uh, cst central sales tax uh, for two percent uh, with against form uh, c that would have been the cost to the manufacturer so to avoid that they used to have the multiple uh, warehouses and uh, now in gst uh, because uh, it is one nation one tax that's the reason uh, such necessary which was there earlier is not there in, now they can have one central warehouse and uh, from the central warehouse goods should be supplied to stockist retailers consumers across the country if the goods are uh, transferred to their own warehouse or uh, uh, their own place outside the state it amounts to uh, uh, supply under GST and uh, uh, the appropriate tax is to be paid on that and the benefit of valuation is also there as per proviso to rule 28 where the recipient is eligible to take the full credit of the tax paid then whatever value is mentioned in the invoice that itself will be treated as open market value and accordingly it becomes a transaction value so uh, though valuation rule is applicable in case of related party transactions and the transactions with the distinct person because of this proviso which is beneficial so uh, whatever rate uh, they feel fit uh, it can be applied in case of uh, brand transfers the recipient branch will be eligible to take the credit so because of this there are uh, savings in case uh, savings from uh, savings on multiple warehouses which was a requirement earlier now there is no such requirement so uh, that is the beneficial thing for the consumer as well and faster movement of the goods due to removal of the border check posts manual toll etc earlier uh, at each uh, border of the state there used to be a check of the goods move, uh, move which are moving to other states Do documents and applicable taxes all those things were to be ma manually checked and because of that there used to be delay and also all this manual toll uh, they have to wait and uh, pay the cash and uh, take the uh, toll uh, receipt so all these things were delaying the movement of goods 
on an average earlier it used to be around 300 to 350 kilometer a day a truck used to uh, run now that has been increased or that has increased after introduction of the gst to 400 to 450 kilometer so there is a, a increase in the speed of the movement of the goods on account of introduction of the gst as well as removal of this manual tool this uh, faster movement of the goods is reducing the lead time that that is uh, making this uh, movement of goods uh, very easy and uh, the uh, time taken for delivering the goods from the warehouse to wherever it is whether in the same state or in other state to the consumers uh, or the retailers it becomes uh, uh, lesser time it is taking so it has become it has become the convenient method and uh, <clears throat> that is the reason many countries are say many uh, many uh, trade and industry who are involved in this uh, fmcg goods are being uh, benefited because of this particular aspect next thing is uh, e-way bill uh, e-way bill as we are aware uh, it is to be prepared uh, by, by the consigner or the consignee or even uh, it can be prepared by the transporter also and uh, it is a very essential document for movement of the goods EVA bill has to be prepared whether goods are being moved for the purpose of sale or uh, other than sale and uh, uh, whether it is uh, for uh, a free sample or uh, it is taken for repair or job work whatever may be the reason wherever there is a movement of goods and that more value of the goods exceeds the specified amount in that particular state so in case of Maharashtra, it is one lakh. In some states, it is fifty thousand. When it the value of the goods increases or goes beyond this particular uh, uh, specified amount, generation of EUA bill is mandatory. EUA bill uh, will contain the specified information, and uh, it has become uh, very difficult in some cases because there are some mistakes which are happening knowingly or unknowingly either by the consigner or the consignee or uh, the transporter who makes the eva bill then for uh, such <coughs> unintentional error also uh, there are situations or cases where uh, heavy penalty is being levied by the department then matter is pending before various uh, high courts for uh, uh, such matters so uh, eva bill uh, the, though the procedure is simple there is no scope for making any error so uh, in, actually speaking in entire gst compliances there is no scope for making any error there is no chance for rectification of uh, most of the errors especially in eva bill also and we are expecting the transporter to be perfect in preparing the eva bill the transporters are the unorganized sector the people involved therein might not be so well educated or might not be familiar with it related things or there are some locations where the internet might not be working properly and also a situation where the vehicle may break down at particular place where there are no uh, internet possible and in such cases if the uh, departmental authorities catches and finds that eva bill is expired or not uh, renewed within the specified timeline then heavy penalty including confiscation of the goods as well as con uh, conveyance all those things will uh, happen so it is very important because in case of fmcg goods movement of the goods are more and it is very frequent in such cases the concerned people will have to be very careful with regard to uh, this compliance of eva bill then IRM, it started with earlier 100 crore uh, turnover, now then 50, now 20, and it may go up to 5 crore uh, very soon. So presently, the, where the aggregate turnover exceeded 20 crores in the last uh, years, uh, IRN, generation of IRN uh, is mandatory. So there are many confusions in the uh, trade and industry generating the invoice uh, within how, how much time IRN is to be generated or uh, IRN is different or uh, uh, invoice is different all those things are there. 
See, the thing is, I, it is a simple thing. Moment you generate the invoice, you need to upload certain particulars to, to the uh, particular website, and IRM will be instantly generated, which you need to mention in your uh, invoice. And uh, without IRM, where it is mandatory, if you issue the invoice, it will not be a valid invoice as per GST law. So what happens if IRM is not mentioned on the invoice or you are not generated the IRM? In such cases, it is as good as you are not issued the document, required document. Invoice is not at all valid. Challenges here are, <clears throat> what happens if you make the mistakes in uh, while generating the IRM? Within 24 hours, you can cancel the IRN and generate a fresh IRN for a fresh uh, invoice. After 24 hours, you cannot do anything. Then the uh, amendment, if at all, is to be done through uh, your uh, GSTR 1 and GSTR 3B. And IRN also, that within 24 hours, there is no scope for making any amendment. So you have to be very, very particular in giving all the details. And correctly, you need to generate the IRN. This will pose one more challenge, uh, say at the end of the month or end of the quarter or at the end of the year. For the purpose of uh, meeting the targets, you will end up generating the uh, invoice uh, to ensure that you are meeting the target. But since the required details to generate the IRN are not available at that particular point of time, what you will do is uh, you will generate the IRN subsequently, say after uh, a week or so. In such cases, whether it can be treated as a sale <coughs> uh, prior to the end of the month or quarter or year as the case may be, or whether the transaction is valid. See, without IRN, if you generate the invoice, as I said, it is not a valid invoice and you cannot move the goods under such documents. If you do so, then all the consequences of uh, uh, not uh, removing the goods under the proper document, including UA bill, etc., will be met with. And uh, also, uh, when the invoice itself is not valid, can you uh, make the uh, entry in your books of accounts as sale? That's a different question which you need to, uh, which your auditor needs to take care. So uh, I mentioning the IRN in the invoice becomes very important. And other advantage with IRN is, moment you generate IRN, certain inform the information with regard to that particular invoice, straight away automatically will go to GSTR1. You need not fill it again. But there are technical glitches as on today. You cannot 100% rely on that. But yes, in time to come, uh, that may be a, a very, <coughs> very big convenience or relief for the people who are generating IRN. And also uh, part A of the EVA bill also will automatically get filled once you generate the IRN. So these are the advantages with regard to IRN, but the disadvantages, there is no scope for making any amendment or you cannot afford to make any correction and you cannot I issue the uh, I invoice without IRN. So th there is not uh, time specified between the date of generating IRN and the between date of the invoice, but that invoice become valid only when you generate the IRN. Then next question is uh, GTA versus GTO. <clears throat> so as we are aware, aware uh, if the service is provided by GTA, it is under uh, reverse charge mechanism, tax is to be paid by the specified person. In FMCG, the movement of goods, as I mentioned, it is uh, huge, so it is very frequent. Service of the GTA is also very crucial in the case of FMCG. And uh, there are also uh, equally uh, usage of GTO in the FMCG sector. So uh, for the purpose of complying the RCM, it is very important to understand who is GTA and who is GTO. Because as we are aware, GTO is exempt from GST. So GTA is the agent who carries the 
transportation of the goods who or who arranges the transportation of the goods and issue the consignment note this is very important unless consignment note there cannot be any gta what is consignment note consignment note is a statutory document whereby uh, the gta takes the custody of the goods for a purpose of transportation so he <coughs> he assumes the responsibility of a bailey he is accepting the responsibility of the transportation of the goods and takes the custody for that so that's a statutory obligation uh, which is coming out of his uh, consignment note whereas in case of gta gto that is not there he gto is like a uh, person or tempo uh, waiting in the naka you will be calling him he comes and takes your goods and dispatches or reaches the particular destination wherever you tell <clears throat> he will not the, take the responsibility of such goods and that thereafter he issues the invoice whereas in case of gta it is his responsibility he takes the custody of the goods and uh, uh, custody of the goods for the transportation and issuing consignment note thereafter he will issue the invoice for the value agreed so it is very important to understand this difference between gta and gto and on gto no tax is involved and in case of gta you have to pay the tax if you are one of the specified entity and accordingly you can take the credit if eligible then one more challenge is there with regard to pay sub supply in case of gta services what happens as the as per the provisions supply to a registered person that is transport gta service to a registered person is the location of such person if the person is not registered then place of supply shall be the location where goods are handed over for transportation <clears throat> so it is very important for you to understand in uh, uh, here uh, what is important is uh, the person who has provided the supply and who is the recipient as far as the recipient is concerned it is you and uh, when you are registered location your location becomes the place of supply and with regard to transfer the gta from where he issues the invoice because normally this gtas are located at various states and uh, their consignment note also would contain the details of their locations across the country uh, they may get, in particular uh, uh, consignment note they may have four five addresses with four five uh, gstin and it becomes really difficult to understand from which location the supply has been done for example if you have to move a goods from say mumbai to ahmedabad you may call uh, the say vrl logistics from mumbai and you may place a po on vrl logistics mumbai and request the goods to uh, deliver at ahmedabad in such cases uh, you uh, the the supplier of the gta service would be location of the supplier would be mumbai because you have placed the order on vrl mumbai and you are registered in mumbai so you become the uh, recipient and your location becomes the place of supply so you have to pay cgst sgst under rcm suppose if you in the same transaction if you have uh, instructed or placed the order on vrl hubli that is karnataka then if he is doing the transportation of the goods from mumbai to uh, uh, ahmedabad in such cases he will issue invoice from uh, uh, hubli uh, to you in uh, you need to pay igst under rcm but there are some cases what happens they may also not uh, do it properly say in the same example instead of issuing the invoice from hubli he may issue invoice from uh, 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 mumbai then though it is his mistake it will lead to lot of confusion and uh, of course uh, there won't be any interest liability in future because of the wrong payment of this thing it's a revenue neutral transaction but still while paying the tax under rcm in case of gta you need to clearly understand the place of supply and understand whether it is interested supply or interested supply and accordingly you discharge the tax liability then loyalty point redemption this is uh, uh, very important uh, now uh, we need to go a bit fast uh, because already it is seven o'clock i will take another 10 minutes 
because of the technical glitch what we have faced uh, <coughs> so loyalty point it's very common in case of uh, modern trade to retain the customer the points are added on purchases and uh, you will be allowed to utilize it in the subsequent purchases either in the same outlet or some other outlet also your uh, data will be kept electronically and on that basis you can see how much uh, points you have accumulated and in your uh, subsequent purchases you can uh, uh, encash that whether it is in the nature of discount or merely method of payment it all depends upon the supplier how he is treating this if he is treating this as a discount then he will reduce it uh, prior to the application of uh, uh, gst and uh, subsequently whatever uh, uh, um, total amount becomes payable you need to pay because discount will be given prior to gst but in most cases it will be treated as merely a uh, reduction in the payment after the charging tax uh, on the gro gross amount payable this uh, uh, point which will be which is to be redeemed that will be reduced and accordingly net amount will be taken from you so it uh, it is a it's a method of payment but it can also be used as a discount if you meet uh, the conditions of section 50 then vouchers the definition has been given uh, in section 218 and the time of supply has also been specified <clears throat> what it says is in case of supply of vouchers uh, by, by a supplier the time of supply shall be the date of issue of voucher if the supply is identifiable at that point for example if you are purchasing vanoshin uh, shirt uh, for say 3000 rupees 500 rupee voucher will be given and that 500 rupee voucher can be used for purchase of vanoshin shirt itself or some other product uh, specifying that particular product say uh, pants or tie in such cases whatever is applicable to that rate would be paid by the supplier subsequently when you use that voucher uh, the amount will be reduced and treated as discount and only on the net amount tax will be levied in case of uh, voucher which can be used for purchase of any uh, product it will be purely treated as a payment method at the time of supply will be the date of redemption of voucher if it is used for purchase of uh, say shirt the rate applicable to shirt would be applied there and if it is uh, uh, used for purchase of some other item and accordingly it will be uh, uh, used as a method of payment only so tax will be on the full value of that particular product and after that it will be uh, taken as a payment made already and that much am less amount will be taken by you when uh, settling the payment then the credit note credit note is very important document and very frequently happening document with regard to fmcg goods so what happens is uh, uh, there is a difference between commercial credit note and uh, gst credit note the commercial credit note is the credit note for reduction of the amount receivable or amount payable uh, here uh, there won't be any impact on the gst compliance the person who issues the commercial credit note he cannot make any adjustment with regard to his output tax liability involved in that particular uh, reduction in the value in case of gst credit note when you issue the credit note as per the provisions of section 34 the you need to you can uh, reduce the uh, well, uh, tax paid tax involved in that particular credit note uh, against your output liability and the recipient has to reduce his uh, itc <coughs> so these are the important difference between uh, and also uh, with regard to this uh, gst credit note you have to issue within specified time limit and disclose in your gstr 3b whereas commercial credit note that can be issued anytime there is no time limit so uh, and also a commercial credit note can be issued for any purpose uh, even if it is bad debt you can issue a credit note whereas a gst credit note should be issued only for those specified uh, occasions or specified reasons which are uh, mentioned in section 34 such as uh, the reduction in the taxable value where there is a reduction in the tax charge and in case of goods returned and where there is a deficiency in supply of goods or services these are the only occasions or the reasons for which gst credit note can be issued 
if you issue any other uh, credit note for any other reasons then you cannot reduce the or uh, take the benefit of reduction of tax liability the details of the credit note should be declared in the month in which it has been issued suppose if you have issued the credit note in the month of april you have to declare it in your gst or tb of april only you cannot issue uh, you declare it in subsequent month the details must be declared in the return not later than september now it has been uh, uh, extended to 30th november following the end of the year or date of furnishing annual return whichever is earlier so within the specified time only it should be declared in the return then no reduction in tax liability if the incidence has been passed on so unless the recipient reduces his tax liability sorry input tax credit you cannot say that the tax incidence you are not passed on so only when you prove that you have uh, not passed on the incidence you will be allowed to reduce your output tax liability then sales return which are frequently happening in case of fmcg goods because of various reasons there may be some slow moving non moving goods which the retailer does not want to keep it in his store which consumes his space so he want to re return it to the manufacturer or the stockist then damaged goods then expired goods because this consumer goods uh, will be having some expiry date that's the reason it should be after expiry rate uh, expired expired uh, goods cannot be sold by the retailer it should be sold well within the specified date on that only and there may be any other <coughs> situation also whereby uh, the retailers or the stockers are required to return the goods to the manufacturer or the stockist as the case may be so how such Uh, movement of goods have to happen it could be under credit note as i mentioned earlier credit note can be issued in those cases where it can be related to invoice it should be done within the specified time limit and uh, the contents should be as per the uh, as it is specified under the rule and upon compliance of all those things gst credit note can be issued recipient is required to reduce his itc and the supplier can uh, adjust that tax uh, paid or tax involved against his output tax liability and uh, so but the problem arises in case of retailer especially in uh, remote areas they may not be able to have the details of uh, uh, original invoice under which these goods which are to be returned are uh, supplied originally in such cases uh, the, you are not able to meet the requirement of uh, credit not as per section 34 and also practically in some cases it may not be possible at all in such cases the retailers or the stockist would uh, return such goods under tax invoice they will charge the applicable tax on that and uh, supply return back to the uh, manufacturer of the stockist as the case may be then what happens to input tax credit so in case of uh, expired goods it is it should be destroyed in some cases it may be remade or repacked and uh, sent back Uh, which is not legally allowed once it is uh, uh, to be destroyed then the as per the uh, as per the expectation of the department you have to reverse the input tax credit if the goods are returned under tax invoice you should not take the credit on such uh, uh, return goods which are meant for destruction because it is not said to be used in the course of furtherance of the business so accordingly based on the facts and circumstances of the case you need to see whether itc is eligible or not and uh, you have to do the compliance then cross charge versus isd it is also very important in case of fmcg since the fmcgs are located at multiple places as in simple terms cross charge uh, where there is a transaction between two and uh, units or two entities or two distinct persons there has to be a cross charge cross charge is mandatory where there is a supply whereas isd is not at all mandatory and uh, uh, as per section 122 if you do the cross charge without there being a supply it is an offense uh, at the same time if there is a supply but you are not done the cross charge then also it is an offense so uh, cross charge is mandatory for uh, understand understanding whether there is a cross charge or not you need to see whether there is a supply or not once there is supply is the involved 
then necessarily you have to do the cross charge so what is amounting to uh, supply that is a, a, a different uh, subject altogether we need to understand it very particularly because in case of goods it is very easy to understand but in case of services you have to be very particular to understand this uh, uh, aspect so only where there is a service uh, supply of service or supply of goods you have to do the cross charge isd is not mandatory in my view but if uh, you opt for isd then the distribution of credit is as per the specified uh, uh, as specified in the law you cannot do as per your own choice whereas in case of cross charge you can uh, take the benefit of provision to rule 28 and you can accordingly determine and do the tax charge then composition dealer i will not go in detail because it's a very common topic and uh, it would have been uh, this thing same because most of the retailers uh, may be using this uh, composition uh, scheme because the turnovers might not be that high so it is beneficial to the composition dealer only disadvantage uh, for uh, in case of composition scheme is the rcm is not applicable and there is a discontinuance of the itc chain so the, the, this is the disadvantage and one percent or uh, the applicable tax which the composition dealer has to pay that he has to pay from his pocket without collecting from the uh, customer so different uh, rates for manufacturers and trader one percent and uh, uh, other compliances i will not go in uh, detail because of the falsity of time and qrmp that quarterly return and monthly payment this is also a very beneficial scheme but of course it, uh, it involves many compliances by the iff is to be adopted that is invoice furnishing uh, facility is to be opted for giving the details you may <coughs> be able to uh, file quarterly gftr1 and gftr3b but you need to make the payment monthly so for all these purpose you need to do so many things except filing the return so in some cases definitely it will be very beneficial uh, less of work and in some cases it may not be that useful anyway it is a very common topic applicable for every trader though it is may, mo, uh, mainly applicable for the traders who have got uh, a lesser turnover uh, the uh, less than 50 lakhs turnover in the previous year uh, oh, sorry uh, in the current year that can be uh, this op option can be opted for next is uh, the partners in fmcg the traditional uh, uh, kirana stores they are still having the bigger market share the more than 80 percent market share is with them and they will have the, their own regular customers based on the customers even price will also will vary they will give credit also and uh, they may the disadvantage is there will be limited brand and the cost of gst compliance is very high for them modern trade that is a departmental store where they give and as well as grocery chain which are gaining popularity now multiple discounts wide product range no middleman economy of scale uh, all those benefits are available and they are generally more organized than the kirana store and the another modern trade is online sale which all of us are using which is gaining popularity day by day uh, the uh, sale through e-commerce operator so with this i would like to end my speech i am once again extremely sorry for the inconvenience caused and i have taken 15 minutes more since i had lost my uh, connection this is what uh, the great person has said in this world nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes that means you cannot avoid taxes you have to pay it thank you very much if you have any questions you can uh, i request you, you can email me so that uh, i can reply or if it is a short question i will be happy to take it thank you very much thank you for your patience and bearing with the technical glitch yes prashant over to you yeah, hi sir good evening to respected vasan sir and my dear friends it was a privilege and a pleasure to give the vote of thanks on behalf of the irc ICI, and uh, on this gst structure services on the city and fmcg uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Vasan sir for taking 
out his valuable time and sharing his knowledge with all of us and it was a really an enriching and informative webinar for all of us apologies to all the dear participants as there was a power tripping which led to this delay and thank you once again for this uh, for attending this seminar thank you thank you very much thank you, thank you prashant ji thank you